What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My The Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and we're back with another guest. What do you know? This week, we have on Alex Dreyfus. He's the CEO of Socios.com. You probably know about them because of their partnerships with a bunch of teams throughout European soccer, Paris Saint-Germain, Barcelona. They actually just invested $100 million in Barca's media studio. Uh, but they're also making a lot of you know, headwinds in the U.S., a lot of NFL, NBA, MLS partnerships. And we had a really great conversation where we spoke you know, in depth about all of that and a little bit about Alex's background, too, and you know, how he was there for the dot-com boom and really has just seen the culture of sports and technology evolve over a lot of years. Really smart guy, really insightful conversation. Let's go ahead and get right into it. We're just going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors over at Oracle NetSuite, and then we'll be right back. 2000, 2008, 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you had the dot-com crash and the housing crash, and then whatever roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it is a dangerous time to not know your numbers, but over 31,000 businesses don't really have that problem because they have the confidence and the clarity they need, and that's because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting, everything that you need to manage risk, get reliable forecasts, improve margins, and the best thing about it is it's all in one place. So when you're thinking about how you're going to prepare for those uncertain times, the answer is easy. NetSuite. You can identify rising costs, automate business processes, and my favorite part, see where to save money. 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgrade to NetSuite. So there's no reason for you to wait, especially because right now NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. So head to NetSuite.com slash my other passion. Head there right now, take advantage of the flexible financing program, and see what you can do for your business. Alex, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, no, very happy to have you here. Where are you coming from? Uh, I'm French. I'm in New York right now, but I'm based in a small island based in, uh, called Malta. It's a small, tiny island uh, south of Italy. You said Malta? Yes. Oh, of course. It's it's beautiful. Cool place. <laughs> um, nice. So you are the CEO of Socios.com, Chili's. And, you know, we've been seeing headlines with your company all over the place, especially the past couple of years, because, you know, this landscape is exploding. Um, you know, sports business in general, when we talk about uh, fan tokens and NFTs. And I would love for you, because there's there's a... I think that there's still like a curiosity around how this stuff works for however many headlines as we've seen. Um, and also maybe people who don't understand the difference between an exchange and a different type of platform and all those things. So can you, can you take a minute to, to tell our listeners, you know, what socios.com is all about and also like the distinction between Chili's and how you all work together? Sure. So let's talk about why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, we believe that 99% of sports fans are not in a stadium, not in a city, and sometimes not even in the country of the team they are supporting. So the question we, 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 we started with, um, with the company almost five years ago, now four and a half years, was what can we create that is both valuable for a fan and scalable for a team? And we realized that two things matter for a fan. One, being recognized that the team is telling me that I'm someone, I belong to that community, and I'm not just a, a, pa a passive uh, Twitter follower or a passive spectator. And secondly, because I'm recognized where, uh, wherever I am in the world, um, I have a voice. And so four and a half years ago, we invented the concept of fan tokens, which are fungible tokens, not like NFTs. Um, mm -hmm. And these fan tokens are more or less like a, a membership program, a, a, a digital membership program that give you the right to vote on decision of the club or the team that are obviously not business or uh, sports, because you cannot touch that. But in the middle, there is enough room to create and to give some power and some benefits to the fan. And so we started that four and a half years ago with two soccer teams. Uh, we call them soccer today, I guess, uh, which were um, Paris Saint-Germain and uh, Juventus. And now we work with 150 teams all over the world um, with any sports. 
uh, and we became the leader and more or less the only company doing this uh, this business. And to the answer about Socios.com and Chili's, Socios.com is the consumer-facing product. It's the, it's the platform, it's the mobile app that people are downloading in order to engage with the teams and to get the benefits of the, of the tokens. Chili's is the blockchain that is behind that provides the transparency, the integrity, and where the tokens are minted and all the uh, infrastructure. So what are some of the, I guess, partnerships that, you are most proud of or you think like show the greatest potential of how this product can work and kind of change the fan experience? Um, I, I think, first of all, uh, one of the first question we, we, we usually have is what is a fan? I think in 2022 uh, and in the next 10 years, there is a, a, a broader definition of what a fan is. In the past, the fan was the guy who was a guy or girl that was, of course, in the stadium and more or less in the community of that stadium. Because of, of um, globalization, social media, athletes becoming superstars, this changed quite a lot during the last 10, 20 years uh, and it's going to most likely amplify. So we, we realized that it's difficult to talk about f- a fan, because fans are multiple tribes who consume sports differently. Someone who is in Korea, in Japan, in France, in Brazil, or in Turkey, and in the US, will, will consume the same brand completely differently. Um, and what we also realize is, it's not that because you were born in Japan or in Turkey, that you should not be uh, considered as a fan, or even as a super fan. You may gonna buy a fake jersey in Thailand, and yet you are a fan. You, you follow the news, you follow the, you, you, um, you watch the match or the highlights, uh, you follow on Twitter, etc. So we... Especially we think, the global nature of the way things are moving. Yes. Like all my friends here in the States have a Premier League team or a La Liga team that they are, you would think it was an NFL team, the way that their fandom is. They'll even travel over to Europe and like, you know, one of the guys we work with, like bases uh, vacation around going to Arsenal and uh, it's definitely an evolved space, uh, but uh, continue, please. Yeah, no. So, and and, and that's the thing, and, and I think it's what we've learned, and sometimes it's I think it's important to acknowledge it's fans are not anymore fans of one team and one sport. They are fans of multiple teams and multiple sports. They may have a bit of an exclusive relationship with one in particular, but they are way more casual and 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 uh, with many uh, many more, and so. Uh, because of that, the, the, the fan tokens and, and the voice and the, and the voting we are giving does make sense for a, for a, for a fan. I give you an example. Three years ago, a bit more than you know, three years ago, we have Juventus, our first Italian team. Uh, they ask their fan, "What music do you want to have in the stadium when we score a goal?" That sounds silly, but for the last eight years, that music never changed. And who else should you ask uh, except your fans? Because they are the one listening, uh, obviously, this uh, the, the music in the stadium. So what was funny as a, as a fun fact on this one is the fan chosen between uh, three or four different songs that chose uh, Blur. Um, and then 6th of January 2020, the, they played a the game, Ronaldo uh, scored three times. So the people in the stadium hear the music three times back to back. Uh, and here it is. The music two years later is obviously still in the in the stadium. But as an even better fun fact, um, if you play f- uh, Pro Evolution Soccer or, fi- or FIFA, I don't remember which one, when you score a goal, you actually have the music that was chosen by the fan uh, because okay, they had to, to 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 use that. Now, when you said they picked Blur, is it song two? Yeah, song two. Yes, of course. Woohoo! <laughs> I got my head checked by a jumbo <laughs> J. Yo, beautiful song, especially if you're you know. If you're into the whole uh, Brit pop thing, because I always love the kind of etymology of that song because Wonderwall came out, Oasis kind of like shut down the conversation of who was the bigger band. And, uh, you know, a couple years later in 97, Blur was like, no, we got a big we got a big crossover hit, too. But it's amazing. Twenty five years later, that's still one of the, the cornerstones of 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 football of when you score a goal, you're going to hear that in the stadium. But I had no idea, uh, you know, the fans were picking that. I knew you all offered fans options, but it's cool to hear these details from you. Yeah. And we, we had, we had, for example, last summer, there is a big Turkish team who asked their fans, 
which number so uh, you know in, in soccer you have this uh, transfer window uh, where you can buy players and so the, the one one team bought a new player and they asked their fans which number do you want that player to have on his jersey again it's a small thing but it helps to build the identity and even the marketing of that player um, and we even have some smaller teams with the approval of Nike Uh, who actually chose the design of the jersey for next season. So that small thing, step by step, uh, we think that the more you give to a fan, the more uh, interaction, the more value, um, and most importantly, the more vested interest the fan will have. So what do you notice, uh, perhaps, as a difference across markets? Because you all are, like, super deep in the NBA, in the NFL, you got MLS, you all across European soccer, ice hockey. Um, I think there's a large association with European football, um, but you all are pretty entrenched in American sports too. And what has it been like scaling different markets for you? Um, so we, we started four and a half years ago in Europe, mainly because we are European. So uh, started from there, started with soccer. Uh, for the last three years or yeah, three years and a half, we were focused uh, outside of US. Uh, so we, we have teams from, um, of course, football slash soccer, but esports, rugby, tennis, Formula One, UFC. Uh, so we, we have really a very large and very broad range of sports. Uh, and then last year, we started to invest in, US, in the US um, and we secured, I think, 20. Uh, NBA teams, 13 NFL teams, uh, the whole MLS, or roughly the whole MLS, uh, a, bit, a few NHL teams. And at this stage, it's still, it's still I would say, the very early stage of our um, um, growth and initiative in, in, in the US, because as we work in the crypto slash blockchain space, there are in some countries different regulatory framework. And in US, actually, funny enough, it's probably the one that is the less the less um, easy to engage with. So we are very conservative. So we take our time in the US. We secure a relationship. We build the brand. You can see, I'm, I'm in New York right now. Uh, you can see our branding at, at the Madison Square Garden, at the Barclays Center, uh, and, and many other uh, property all over, the, uh, all over the US. But we are not yet active as a, as a fan platform, or at least not in a significant way. And we hope it's going to happen in the next few months. Yeah, your partners with both... Uh my teams, uh, Chicago Bulls, Chicago Bears. So that alone lets me know I should be keeping was, an eye out here. I was actually Monday night. I was in Boston for the England, uh, New England's uh, Patriots versus the Chicago Bears. was my first ever NFL match. It's very difficult for me to get it. Uh, well, and... no, but let's tell us about that. You know, I would love <laughs> to hear. What was your first, what was your impression? Because so much, I was just telling you about my friends who go over to Europe to watch Premier League and La Liga and Bundesliga. What was it like coming and checking out the sport that, I'll tell you, basically like runs American sports culture? I love NBA. I love everything else. But when you look at the viewership and the engagement, NFL is on a different level. And I've never considered that, you know, an adult, dude who's like super familiar with sports doing all this big work in sports would uh would be able to tell me about going to the first nfl game so I, i'm really curious i got to hear your story it, it's a good point so uh we, we are a partner of the of the patriots so we are a sponsor of the patriots and the new england uh, revolution the soccer team so um, actually i came to visit the facilities and i was uh, lucky enough to be invited by the Kraft family so it was literally my first ever nfl game Uh, I mean, the, the experience is obviously amazing. I'm not going to lie. I didn't understand all the rules uh, because I never watch even NFL on TV. That's not a thing, in, uh, you know, in Europe. Um, and uh, what I was surprised and a little bit frustrated, it, in a way, it's how slow it is, how, the, um, how the fragmented the game is. Uh, the downs, you stop. Yeah, I mean, every two minutes. Uh, in Europe, you know, when you watch soccer uh, or, or, or football, I mean, it's uh, 45 minutes in one go and another 45 minutes in one go. There is no, there is no pauses. So this, I'm But not used to that. But then you have games that are like zero one. That's the American. Oh criticism. my God, that's that's the yeah. But I, I, it's funny because everybody is telling me that, and I disagree. It's so much intense to watch a soccer game than an NFL game for me. 
uh, as a Europe- European. Well, you know what person. you know what I realized because I've only recently really started going to soccer matches. Um, as you can see, it's blowing up in in the states. So I went to MLS game. I know your partners with them. Um, it was LA Galaxy versus LAFC. I'm out in California. I realized, and it, you can't totally gauge this on TV the same way. It's whether they score or not. Every every strike, every attack, like it's intense you know it has that intensity around it and so i understood how even low scoring games are just like filled with you know serious tension and fandom and every single possession every single time you get close to the opponent's goal it matters you know so not to say it does i mean nfl is the same thing with the end zone but it's like there's just like a quickness. It's either it happens or it doesn't. It's not four downs to determine. Uh, of course, sometimes people, you know, they'll convert on first or second down, but the pace is interesting and the difference in how we consume culturally, likewise. But even last night, uh, I was on the, um, so last night I was watching uh, the um, Knicks versus uh, the Hornets. Um, and it was my first time actually. I was on the court side, so again, as a, as a European guy, I had an amazing experience. It was very cool, and the, the atmosphere in the at the garden is is incredible. But the amount of timeout uh, during a game is is, is incredible. Uh, I don't get it. I really, really don't get it. But anyway, that's not uh, that, that, uh, the truth to be told, and I'm not ashamed to say that publicly. Uh, I didn't came in that space because I was a sports fan. I'm actually not a sports fan. I'm a tech guy, geeky guy. Uh, been in the internet space for 25 years. Uh, so created different internet companies, including in the sports betting industry and a few other stuff. So uh, I'm fascinated by the technology and how you can use the tech. But I'm still learning. I'm still in a learning curve in terms of at least American sports. So what was it like uh, that invitation from the Kraft family? Did you get to hang out with Robert Kraft? Ah, uh, you can check on my Twitter. <laughs> yeah, 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 I was, I was, uh, I was, I was very happy. I had a nice picture with uh, Robert Kraft and, and uh, Jonathan, and everything was it was very nice. Uh, it was on the field actually, um, uh, which was very cool. You know, when uh, um, uh, he entered into the into the into the arena or into the field, that was with the, him behind him. It was very very nice. I always ask this on the show when people talk about experiences with, like, you know really impressive figures um and Kraft certainly has a lot of a lot of experience you know he's he's a in the coveted position of nfl team owner and is there anything that you picked up for him like a, a bit from the conversation that you remember um I, i'm curious i mean uh, i know they were not happy that they didn't win that that game that i can tell you yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, just I, what I'm is sure. what is he like? What is what's his vibe? What's his vibe in real life? What did you, you know? What uh, did I you mean, think? I don't know. What, what was my first time? So uh, I will not be able to to tell you. But uh, obviously, very friendly. Uh, and again, because maybe I'm a sponsor or I'm European, so it's a bit different than the, the daily uh, uh, routine, probably. So we talked about many things. I will not disclose what. Uh, but but it was very nice for me. Again, it was it was a great experience. Learned a lot. Um, interestingly, uh, the suite is very very high. I think it's on the top of the of the arena. So the the view that you have. Versus when you do an uh, NBA where you're on the court side, it's completely different. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, they call it the owner's box. They're way up uh, there <laughs> making decisions. <laughs> um, well, we talked about this difference um, in, you know, you're new to NFL and it's not the most popular sport in Europe. Um, but have you seen how the NFL is really trying to penetrate the market over there? They go, they play in Germany, Germany, they, go, yeah. they play in London quite a bit. You know, you got Roger Goodell talking about, could we start a division over here? The NFL, he said that he thinks London could support two NFL teams. Uh, I even heard rumors that the Super Bowl might be played over there around 2026. We'll see if that materializes. One thing that I find curious about it, when that comes up, people tend to say, okay, from a timing perspective, from a travel perspective, like, I don't know if this is realistic. Um, I personally would love to see it, uh, but I do hear the, the, the criticism. You're over there. Um, what do you think? Is the NFL going to be a mainstay in Europe question. in the next couple of decades? 
It's a very good question. I, I will bet more money on hopefully soccer becoming more and more successful in the US uh, because you can see uh, that young generation are very much into um, soccer in the US due to demographics reason and everything. Uh, clearly, that's a sport that is picking up. Um, and, and because it's a global game with global celebrities, uh, you know, when you look at uh, Tom Brady, uh, when you look at is at his uh, twi Twitter account. I think there is 3 million followers, something like that. When you look at Ronaldo account, there is 300 million or 200 million followers. So it's very interesting to see uh, the, the, the difference. And um, I, I would not be educated enough or knowledgeable enough to know uh, if, it, if uh, NFL as a, um, as a league or a division will work in, in Europe. Honestly, I don't know. I'd love to have a Super Bowl because that would create a massive event. What would be cool, actually, is that indeed, during the World Cup in the US, you have a, a soccer World Cup uh, you, or FIFA World Cup. You have a, a Super Bowl in Europe. That would be an amazing year. Uh, it would be very oh, interesting. Wow. I didn't even consider that the 2026 rumor aligns with yep. the with the you know US North American World Cup. Uh, I'm really I'm looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a watershed moment for yes. soccer in the US. And I've and I've seen it. You know, I'm I'm someone who grew up here. I grew up, I played basketball, baseball, football, like a lot of American kids. Those are our big three. You know, if not, people are doing tennis or doing hockey. Um, but soccer, the game has changed. My kids are in soccer. Um, those fields are just packed. You know, it's the, the potential, the love for the sport has grown even in, I'd say, the last few years. We've entered uh, a new, you know, a new territory. Uh I think you need a generation to take to actually have the sports to come in. So your kids will need another ten years, more or less, to grow up and become adult or, uh, or to get, get there, and and that's going to take a generation. But in the next generation, for sure, soccer is going to be significant uh, in, in right, the US. You're going to have kids who grew up and they didn't have to see a shift. They just grew up in yeah. a time where soccer was fairly popular in the states. Yeah. Well, you said that you are a geeky guy, <laughs> internet space. Um, where did you, how did you, you know, get to this point? And, and can you tell us more about like that passion of yours and, and that side of your career? So um, I, the reality is I got my first computer when I was six, six years old. So I got to more or less, I got to learn how to read the same time I got to learn how to code or at least how to interact uh, with a computer. And that was uh, the, the, the 1984. Um, and from that point, I grew with a computer at home, different computers. I was lucky enough to have a father that was able to afford it and change whenever there was a new computer coming in, uh, in the market. And so uh, I became a geek uh, or, uh, yeah, I became a geek thanks to that. And I became passionate by compu uh, computer. I became, became passionate by what you can create with that. And what happened in 1994, um, I actually, I left school in 1998 when I was 18, because in, in, uh, in, Fran in, Fran in uh, France, you cannot resign from school or you cannot quit school before 18 before the, um, you're an adult, otherwise you need the authorization of your parents. But they didn't give me that authorization, so I had to wait to be 18 uh, years old and one month. And I left school and I created my first company uh, in uh, 1995, which became one of the first web agency at that time, meaning that uh, uh, imagine the, the early days of the internet when you need to buy a domain name, install an email, and literally connect a modem to, your, uh, to the wall. Uh, to get internet that's what i was doing in 1995 uh, and for a few years uh, and, and then did a couple of other businesses uh, the, the other one was called uh, webcity.com was the would be the equivalent of yelp today or that kind of thing but it was in 1997 uh, and and long story short i've done that for 15 years i mean for 20 years not 20 25 years different internet companies some succeeded some failed i spent more than 10 years in the sports betting slash on um, online poker industry uh, in europe uh, building technology organizing uh, tournaments working a lot with regulators. We were licensed and regulated in France and a few other countries. Um, and eventually I ended up selling my business in 2012 to a US listed company called Bali Technology, which became Scientific Games. Uh, and that's how I really started to uh, 
uh, spend time in the US and try to understand the dynamic in terms of sports and media here. Uh, and that was, yeah, 10 years ago. Being on a computer in 1984, you were you were right there. That's when personal computers started hitting. Obviously, you yep. know, that's when that's when Microsoft and Windows starts. Because I don't even think it was Windows yet, but but Microsoft, no, Windows, no. I, IBM. It, it was, it was like MS DOS. It was it was Microsoft DOS MS DOS. Yep. It was called. Yeah, I remember. Um, so like, so I was born in the late 80s. Um, so I didn't have the same perspective on the on the like revolution. But I do appreciate that because, like, by the time I'm, you know, a kid, you know, I'm like nine, ten years old, I see the internet. It's like I got to see the world before and the world after, and I'm grateful for that because uh, I think it adds some some perspective on just how far we've come. Did you? What did you think like when the Macintosh dropped in '85? Uh, so I didn't get the first Mac. I, I, I first I was a PC guy for whatever reason. Uh, well, I guess for well, because it was cheaper. Uh, I got an Amstrad. I mean, before PC, I, I had something else, uh, two different things. And then I got my first PC, um, Amstrad something, 8086 was called, uh, and then different things. And I, I don't remember when I moved uh, to a Mac. Um, I remember it was a Mac LC2. Uh, and then I had like five or six or seven, and I had something in the 19 uh, let me think 1993 i will say i had something called a bbs built-in board system if you get with my uh, accent uh, which was uh, early stage actually it was before the internet when you had a network of computers where you have forums and news group and people oh. can download uh, these uh, locally they can engage and then they upload uh, back to the to the server uh, was very decentralized, actually, funny enough. Um, and, and I had my BBS in, uh, in 93, 94, probably 94. Uh, and that's really how I started to have internet. And uh, I mean, internet, email. Uh, and, and then I will always remember when my, my first interaction with internet, uh, my, uh, what was it? The, the sister of my father was working in a university in France, in uh, Lyon, my home city. And they had access to internet. They were the first one to have access to internet. So she brought me there and I downloaded a file. Uh, I don't know what it was. And uh, I downloaded a file that was in the US. And I was terrified. It took, I don't know, a few minutes, a few hours. I don't know. But I, I was terrified that, oh, shit, this is going to cost a fortune uh, to uh, the university because I downloaded like a 500 kilobyte of, uh, <laughs> a file. And, and I still remember that I see myself right now in that room. Um, but that was my first interaction with the real internet. Uh, and then um, then um, I grew up with it. Uh, and I've been part of this first generation of web 1.0, um, oh. uh, which is important because when we talk about web 3.0, which actually I disagree as a statement, I don't think we are there yet. I think we are, uh, I know it's going to sound cliche and a bit a buzz, but uh, we are more 2.2, 2.5 than 3 at that point. Uh, and, and I do believe that the best so-called project or ventures in that space right now, hopefully socials.com is one of them, uh, is if you have the luck to have the expertise of the last 20 years on the internet, then you have a little bit of an edge about understanding of how it works and how it's going to grow. And we, at least that's what I believe. Remember when that 3.4 megabytes on the floppy disk was like massive? Of course. I had that. I had the 5.5, five, five, I mean, the 3.4 and the 5.5, I believe. The, yeah. the, 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 the black one and the blue one for me, uh, uh, that, that, was the, that was the good time. Yeah, man. It, uh, how do you think about... I think I could tie this question together because I was already before you said that you don't think we're at 3.0 yet. I was going to say, like, in your wildest dreams, as someone who was so intimately familiar with the internet from basically, you know, its consumer inception, um, are you surprised? Like, like, or did you, I, I wonder, people in 93, 94, because around that time you have a lot of media that's saying, it's a fad. <laughs> what is this thing? You know, I, there's an amazing clip from, like, Good Morning America or something in the mid-90s, and they're just spending the, the half the suck. Yeah, they're just like joking about the internet and they're like, you know, all right, dude, we whatever. Um, and so I wonder, you know, was that more of the consensus? Was someone like you realizing, no, 
the type of stuff that we have now in the 2010s, 2020s, um, I saw it getting to that point. Um, you know, I, I love hearing the early internet talk. So, and like for for for, for, for me, um, I don't rem- in, in all fairness, I don't remember everything of 25 years ago. <laughs> but uh, when I, I was 18 at that time, and and um, I had to fight to explain to my parents, to my family, to my friends, hey, I'm quitting school in 1995 because I want to create an internet company. I'm like, you know, what is internet at that point? Uh, and, and so it was a lot of education. It was a massive leap of faith. Um, it, it was probably more an entrepreneurship kind of uh, DNA uh, rather than purely tech play. Um, and uh, and yes, and, and, and I'm 100% convinced that the same... Um, vibe and probably uh, how you call that um, p- people who are lo- laughing at us today uh, when you walk a bit in the blockchain space and the crypto space um, the one who love at us today I've seen this uh, I've seen this 20 years ago and 25 years ago and I'm very happy to be where I am today so good luck to them well can you actually tell them what you've learned uh, from taking those type of leaps of faith. A lot of our listeners are, you know, super aspirational people. They're starting their own businesses or they're rising through the ranks of, you know, the, the corporation that they're at. And you took a chance on the internet when people were making jokes about it. You have your founder, socios.com, Chili's like, you know what it's like to run a business, the, the the joys of it, the pains of it. And, uh, you know, can you share a bit of advice uh, about what you've learned? It's difficult to give advice. It, for me, it's, uh, it's more about talking about experiences uh, because whatever yeah, maybe, I... Yeah, maybe more so your, your yeah. experience and what you've learned rather than trying to tell people what to do. But what are like some core beliefs that you live by uh, from so, your experiences? Uh, I, I'd say, you know... Um, one thing I've learned, at least in the internet space, purely just internet space in the last 25 years, is the pure players always win. So uh, for the last 25 years, you always have a, a retail company that wants to go in the web uh, industry, I mean, wants to um, pivot into the um, web industry. And because they have already the network of shops or they have the sourcing or they are a telecom company or a media company, they think they're going to succeed. They never. In the last 25 years, there is barely any case uh, where a traditional business, uh, brick and mortar business that succeeded succeeded online. It was all, always a pure player. And I think in the crypto space, it's going to be very similar in a way that uh, actually crypto and sports, uh, you're not going to have a sports team that's going to innovate or a league that's going to innovate because they're not built for that. Uh, you will always have a pure player that's going to come with a crazy idea. People's going to laugh at them, but then they're going to deliver. And that's going to become a standard. And that's true today with Netflix. I mean, you, I don't know in the US, but in Europe, every single media group laughed at Netflix uh, 10, 15 years ago. They say, oh, no, no, we are the biggest media company in France, in Spain, in Italy. This will never work. We have the rights. We are the, we are the biggest, blah, blah, blah. That model will never work. Here we are. Same with music, Spotify. That's, that's true with every single vertical. In sports, the difference is you're not going to change the game. So the game is not going to change. The, the spectatorship is not going to change. But you can expect, hopefully, that some of the relationship is going to be enhanced. And I'm a strong believer that we should use technology not to replace, but to enhance, to, to, bring, to, to give more. And, and for that, I believe that startups, even though we're not really anymore startups, but uh, uh, companies like ours and many others are going to bring value. A lot of us are going to die as well in the meantime, and that's a natural process. Uh, not everybody can make it. Um, and so it's a matter of also uh, keep doing what you believe is right. And I know that sounds a bit of a cliche, but for example, uh, four years ago when we started with fan tokens, nobody understood what it was. First, because we invented it. Secondly, we invented the name even uh, as a fun fact. Um, fan tokens originally were called voice token uh, because uh, uh, at least as a French we wanted to say hey you're going to have a voice and you can vote but when we started to pitch that in 2018 people say oh you're launching the next Skype or telecommunication company we say oh no no so we we came back to the fan token but 
when you look at the at the massive hype in 2021 in the NFT space and um, you know the NBA Top Shot and all of this stuff, which are cool, uh, but everybody like a good sheep went into that space, put a lot of money, uh, and say, oh, NFT is the next thing, or the, the NFT as we've seen it is the next thing. But you know what? NFT is a technology. It's not a product. So you first need to find the right product using the technology rather than trying to do anything that is branded NFT to be successful. Um, and you may not going to build a product that is fit to market. And that's fine. But that's going to cost you a lot of money. And I believe, and now I spent a week here in New York, met a lot of sp um, sports industry stakeholders and, and investors in that space. A lot of people got burned by the NFT uh, space the last 18 months. Uh, and, and I think... I did. There is, <laughs> I think there is a wake-up call on that, which is an healthy one, in all fairness. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an healthy one. And me being obviously not objective on that one, we believe, and going back to my business, we believe that fan tokens are actually a much bigger and much scalable business than traditional NFTs as we know them today because it's more scalable, it's more liquid. And, and the irony of it is uh, NFT is by definition non-fungible. But it's because it's non-fungible that it's not scalable. And uh, when you have a sports team who has 100 million fans or 50 million fans or 20 million fans, why are you working on something that has 10,000 uh, NFTs? That, that, that's never going to work. So we, we feel that our model, even though it's different, uh, is one of the winning ones. And I can see from the feedback here in the US in the last few days and few weeks that uh, it's uh, heading in the right direction. That makes me think about the perception of this technology, especially, you know, with this sort of crypto winter crash that we're in. Now, all of a sudden, there was all this hype last year. And now you see the people, I knew it was a Ponzi scheme and uh, this is fake. And, uh, you know, you all got burned. Ha ha. And what makes you think that it's not a novelty? Uh, specifically socios.com like like what makes you say that yeah maybe some of these things aren't built to last that's a reality of business i don't think we've ever gone through a technological shift where the majority of businesses you know like the case is always that the majority of businesses don't make it why will socios make it why are you all like set to be here in five years and 10 years and actually be like an ongoing part of of the conversation around sports I like that question. So, um, first is the utility. Uh, the, the, the main work of our company, and I, I don't think I said that as an introduction, but no, we are 300 full-time employees. We have nine offices all over the world. And the reason I'm saying that is because we spend a lot of time working with sports property, and especially team. The reason I'm saying team, uh, teams and not leagues, it's because uh, fan engagement is a team business, not a league business. And the relationship you have between you and your team should be the team business and not the league. In, U in the US, it's different because leagues are in control of a lot of things. But in the rest of the world, the uh, teams really manage their own stuff. Um, so the, the reason I believe we are here to stay, I, I guess the numbers first. Um, right, right now, there is still thousands thousand of thousands of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of users that are still using and engaging and buying and even trading fan tokens today, despite the, 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 the crypto bear market. Uh, and the reason behind that is because our narrative about creating utility and gamification around the utility of me being a fan anywhere in the world is relevant. Our main markets right now are Brazil, Turkey, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia. It's not it's not uh, it's not France, it's not um, UK, it's not the traditional market. It's actually markets where there, there are fan bases that wants to engage with these international brands, but they have nothing to engage with. Uh, and, and, and that's where we believe uh, we, we have a play. And the more I talk to uh, team owners, and I will not name anyone, but the more it, it makes me think we are right because they are all looking ways to grow out of their domestic market. They are all trying to find ways to, to offer more to their fans globally. Uh, and our product is just one solution. It's not the solution. But because we are dedicated to that only, because we are creating a massive network effect, 
And the network effect in sports is important. Why? Because you can be a fan of UFC. You can be a fan of Formula One. You can be a fan of NBA. You can be a fan of, so of soccer or Barcelona and Arsenal. So the, the more we aggregate this IP on the same ecosystem and the same platform, the more you have a chance to give and to attract users that's going to interact with all of these platforms. And what we've learned after four and a half years working with sports property is... And, and I will say that outside of the US, to be fair, because I, I'm not educated enough here. Um, but th there is a lack of investment in innovation, mainly because every single penny has to go back to buy new players in Europe. I'm talking in soccer. Uh, mm -hmm. And so nobody is really investing in what's next. So there, there are room for companies like us to actually provide infrastructure, resources. We, um, we, we are translating our businesses and we have offices, as I said, in nine, country, in, uh, yeah, in nine countries, but we are translating, I think, in 12 or 13 languages. Paris Saint-Germain or Barcelona doesn't have a website where there is 13 languages on their website. And I, I'm not intending to do that, but my point is, how can we help Barca which we recently invested $100 million in a digital arm, how can we help Barca to be more successful in Indonesia, in Korea, uh, in Brazil? They're not going to do that on their, on their own. And most of the teams will not do that on their own. So that's where we have a play. That makes sense. I actually want to follow up because I wanted to talk about Barca. So Barca Studios, you all <laughs> got to stay, got to stay hydrated. Plus, that's your French. You're repping with the French. That's Avion. It is such. It is wonderful water. Uh, you know, I uh, love. Let me show you something. Uh, you, you you can hear me. Uh, let me just because I haven't been in US for the last uh, three uh, two. I mean, before COVID. And the first thing when I did when I opened the fridge here in the other room is I found this Avion, and this Avion is sparkling. That doesn't exist. In the rest of the world, there is not such, such a thing that Avion sparkling water. It's the first time in my life I see that, and I was very offended because <laughs> Avion sh should be just still water. Well, um, I'm going to take it from the French guy how things <laughs> should be when it comes to that. But back to Barca. Barcelona, probably the most valuable, most popular soccer club in the world, uh, like a lot of other you know, European teams, you're seeing these clubs create media arms. Barca has Barca Studios. The report came out that you all invested, like you said, $100 million. Um, I think it's about, what, a 25% stake. What was the impetus behind that? What have you seen? Why was it worth $100 million? Break it down for us. So um, we've been working with Barca for the last three years already so we launched the barcelona fan token uh, was our fourth or fifth uh, team i think and it was our biggest team actually um, after paris saint germain and um we, we've built a relationship with them now barcelona uh, unlike psg which is owned by um, qatar or uh, arsenal which is owned by an american billionaire or chelsea which is owned by an american billionaire or another uh, uh, ac milan owned by a pe fund so all of this entity uh, they more or less control their their, 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 their their equity value they can invest they have access to cash barcelona and real madrid is a little bit different because they are not private entities they are run or own, but let's say run by their members, which are actually called socios. That's why we, we are called like this. And so they don't have access to the same amount of cash and, or capital. And so they, they were looking to to try to, to bring new uh, capital in, in, in the business because they needed it. That's not because of us. They needed that. Uh, and so they spin off their kind of a digital arm. Only the new let's say, new digital product, NFT, blockchain, metaverse, everything that is a bit more or less tokenized um, or can be tokenized is in this new arm. And we decided to invest. Uh, there, there was a process and, and, and we participated. And we decided to invest because we do believe, of course, that's the future. And we do believe that us as socios.com, we should help uh, clubs like this, especially when it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest brand in the world in terms of, of uh, football and soccer, how can we uh, try to um, monetize this? And does it worth $100 million? Well, I'll tell you in a few years. Uh, for now, I don't know. What I know is that it helped us building new product, and it will take at least 12 months, if not more, to really pick up. But um, 
we, we are very confident. I was talking to someone here in New York uh, this week who was telling me that when ba the, the Barcelona ratings, uh, when they play versus actually Real Madrid, uh, usually is 25 or 30 percent more uh, than any other club in the U.S. So that could be also interesting for us how we can leverage that in the U.S. Yeah, I actually uh, had the wonderful opportunity to go out to El Clasico. I believe that was back in March. Um, so, you know, went to the stadium in Madrid, um, got to sit down with folks at La Liga, you know, talking about the CVC investment that they just got. There's so much uh, American interest in soccer right now, all these American owners coming over. Um, definitely something that we like talk about on front office sports a lot. But I want to ask you about... I guess another measure of success, um, which is revenue, which is user base, which is, you know, are you profitable or are you trending toward it? Uh, what do the numbers look like on that front? Uh, what can I share with you? So the, first of all, we, we, we never raise capital, so we don't have uh, private equity or VC or, um, or investors. So it gives us a bit of a freedom uh, in terms of what we can or want to do. Um, and the reason behind that is mainly because we also have our own token uh, that is one of the most liquid token in the, in, the, in the crypto space globally. It has nothing to do with the US, uh, and that's that's a way for us to be to to, me to measure as well a bit of a success. Uh, in terms of user base, we are a little bit less than two million users on socials as as an app, as an ecosystem, as a platform. We do have more users who own fan tokens on crypto exchanges, um, and probably another two million, I will say globally. So uh, let's say a little bit low, um, less than five million. Um, users involved with our ecosystem now in terms of revenue we, we don't communicate about that I, I can give you a couple of numbers last year we paid paid in cash not in crypto not in token not in whatever you want in real cash dollars uh more than 200 million dollars to the sports industry um and that was partially some of the revenue share we generated with the teams um and we were highly profitable last year uh, this year will be a completely different animal. We will pay less and we will lose money. And I'm not afraid of that because the market is what the market is. And and for us, it's interesting because I like this bear market. I like the fact that everything is more complicated right now because it, it calmed down every expectation. There was way too much money, including from us. You know, I don't like to take the credit that we were super successful last year. We were super successful as well because of the market. It's not just because we are good uh, whatsoever. So um, I think it's important that there is that all of this is balanced, uh, and we, we are part to be part of. It. I mean, we are uh, happy to be part of it. Um, but the reality is, this year we're still going to pay a th a three uh, three digit um, revenue or a license or whatever to all of the sports industry. And hopefully that will still be the case in the next few years. Yeah, this market kind of separates the mice from the men. Um, <laughs> I know some folks over at Crypto.com and they kind of shared a similar sentiment because, you know, people are like, oh, well, that Crypto.com arena turn into Enron Field <laughs> the way that, you know, this market is. But um, I think the people and the entities that last, um, will maybe have the opportunity to prove out that this is not a fad, that this isn't novel, that this is the internet in 1995. And, and to be fair, uh, it's very, actually, uh, we, we are very close to the crypto.com guys. Uh, I think it's very unfair the, um, sometimes the headlines uh, that they get because not only uh, they are very strong and powerful company, they have, I don't know, 50 million users or like a decent, I mean, a very big number. Uh, but also the, the fact that the arena is now called crypto.com is great for the whole industry. It's not called alex.com, it's called crypto.com. So they are promoting literally the vertical uh, and, and, and the industry uh, through their name. So, and, and the amount of money they spent, which I believe is a $35 million a year, it's not like they put $700 million up front. They have to pay like everybody else. Uh, every year a fee. Uh, trust me, uh, 35 million a year, a year for crypto.com is a no-brainer uh, and it's not an issue. So uh, that, that's false narrative. Uh, there is a lot of haters uh, because there are a lot of people who didn't jump into the crypto train, which is fair. It's not for everybody at the same time. But it feels so a I much better to say, oh, 
I missed I the you. train and I'm glad that I missed it. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's tough. Of that's course, that's how course. it goes. You know, you were talking about courtside. I had my first courtside experience the other day because uh, I went to Lakers opening night with that team, uh, CMO over there, Stephen Kalifowitz. Kal- and um, they're actually up to 70 million now. They're like just now starting to use that number. But you now they're basically trying to say, look, we, we're confident about this space. And um, it's interesting hearing the same thing from you. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm absolutely. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I was just saying socios.com. It's like, you know, you're you're counting on that being one of the mainstays of this space as it evolves over the next several years. Yeah, I mean, we, we I know, and t- time will tell, obviously, but we, we are definitely committed to the sports space, not to be a sponsor, but to be a partner and not to be a partner that just wants to promote our brand. We actually want to promote the brand of the team. I'm going to give you an example. Last year for Inter Milan, the, um, the soccer team in, uh, in Italy, we were the main sponsor of the jersey. So literally the, the, the jersey sponsor wa- was us. We paid its public amount and we paid $16 million uh, or euro at that time uh, to be there. But on that jersey, we didn't put socios.com uh, uh, on, on the top of the jersey. We actually put Inter fan token. So we paid 16 million euro in order to promote a category, to promote the product and not the brand. And it was not even our brand. It was the brand of the team that we were paying. So that was interesting. Didn't work very well, by the way, Uh, but that was interesting. Uh, And again, we, we are testing, we are trying, we will fail. Most of our initiative will fail. But what matters is that we educate and you know, they, they, we always say try, uh, try, fail, fix, or actually uh, fail fast, uh, because then you can start again and you can improve and enhance. And for us, it's, a little, it's, it's exactly the same. There are a lot of initiative and innovation to be done in the, in the sports space. I think uh, everything is undervalued uh, and you can create a lot of value from a team po- uh, point of view, but from a fan point of view. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking value as a service, uh, as as benefits I'm getting. And that's where I think we will hopefully succeed in the next uh, five to 10 years. Well, we'll be keeping an eye out for you. Before we uh, get out of here, I did want to take a second to understand a little bit more about you. I can I can feel the passion. You know, I can, I can see that you are super experienced and, you know, that alone... Uh, is compelling. And, you know, beyond socios, beyond the category, um, who are you, Alex? Like, you know, what what do you what do you like to do? What kind of things keep you well rounded as a person, as an executive? Um, you know, uh, I, can, I can see you're coming from France. I'm sure <laughs> that, you know, helped helped mold some things in your personality, <laughs> like your love for so, Avion Water. Uh, but yeah, I, I, tell us who you are. Uh, what can I say that makes sense? I mean, first of all, I, I, I don't consider myself as an executive. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm the founder of the company. I'm, I own 80% uh, roughly of the, of the company. So uh, this is my baby. Um, and it's not um, f- for me because I'm already settled. Um, I have everything I need in life. Uh, this is just pure pleasure. So I don't have a lot of hobby. My hobby is to work and my wife and my kids, they, they hate that. Yet this is who I am. That's, you know, that, that's what I like to do uh, uh, all the time because it's exciting. Um, if I had to, to chill, I said the two things that I like to do besides being with my family is obviously traveling uh, and uh, watching stupid stuff on Netflix. Well, a lot of us have the same hobby, so, <laughs> so I can relate. Um, you know, one thing that that stuck with me and i think it sort of showed itself in what you were talking about in terms of you know how these next five or ten years are going to go for socios and for the uh, category at large do you think that the role that you're going to play is what takes us from what you labeled as internet 2.5 you know we're getting a lot of web 3 hype um but why do you think we're not actually at web 3 what does web 3 look like and does your business help accelerate us toward that? Um, I guess our business helps to educate. Um, it helps to onboard uh, users and IPs or companies to actually understand. Um, but th- there is one thing that I've learned the last 25 years is 
there is one thing you cannot buy, it's time. And you only need time to actually not only bring legitimacy, but utility. So uh, the only way we will be successful in that in five years, there will be still users, fans that say, oh, yes, I did that with my uh, fan token. I've done that with socials. So we need to prove to prove that we are right. But you can do it for 12 months. That's great. But you need to scale that in a, for a certain time to ensure that it's sustainable. Uh, and only the people who will still be there in the next five years uh, will be able to deliver that. Well, good luck, Alex. And uh, good luck with your baby. I love a good, you know, risk-taking entrepreneur. I can't believe you said you have to tell people in uh, the mid-90s that I'm quitting to focus on the internet. But look at you now. So uh, I think that's a lesson for all of us. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Alex for coming out, telling us all about Socios.com, a little bit about his background as an entrepreneur. Really enjoyed that conversation. Of course, we will be back next Wednesday with another guest. Hope you've been enjoying. Go leave a review on Spotify or Apple if you have. Make sure you're checking out the other front office sports podcasts, the lead off, the newsroom. There's a lot more on the way, a lot to be excited about, but for now, I'm out of here.